On January 17, 1961, Lumumba alongside two other companions, Joseph Okito and Maurice Mpolo, were flown to Lubumashi where they were delivered to the secessionist regime in Katanga and its Belgian advisors. This was the first time that Mr. Patrice Lumumba would come face to face with those who sought to overthrow him and those that he himself sought to overthrow. And it's sad that he met them when he was at his weakest. He had no army, no weapons, nothing. It was just him, his god, and his two companions. A young Patrice Lumumba was born on July 2nd, 1925 in the village of Onalua in Kasai province, Belgian Congo. He was a member of the small Batetela ethnic group, a fact that would go on to become significant in his later political life. After attending a Protestant mission school, Lumumba went to work in the Kinduport Empain, where he became active in the club of Evolves, also known as Western Educated Africans. While in Kinduport, Lumumba did two significant things. He began to write essays and poems for the Congolese journals, and he used that as leverage to apply for Belgian citizenship. A smart move because it paid off. He did get the citizenship. After getting full Belgian citizenship, Mr. Lumumba then moved to what is now known as Kinshasa to become a postal clerk. While there, he transitioned to become an accountant in the post office of Stanville, now known as Kisangani. Fast forward. The year is 1955. Lumumba has become a regional president of a purely Congolese trade union of government employees that was not affiliated to either of the two Belgian trade union federations, as was the case for the socialist and Roman Catholic unions. Mr. Patrice also became active in the Belgian Liberal Party of the Congo. Mr. Patrice took a liking into the Congolese trade union simply because it was neutral. It is the exact same reason that prompted him to join the Belgian Liberal Party of Congo. Because just like the Congolese trade union, it wasn't linked to either of the trade union federations. Federations which, by the way, were very hostile to the Belgian Liberal Party. In 1956, Lumumba was invited with others on a study tour of Belgium under the oversight of the Minister of Colonies. The shocking thing is that upon return, Mr. Patrice was arrested and charged with the embezzlement of funds from the post office. He was convicted and condemned one year later and forced to serve a 12 months prison sentence. What the Belgian authorities and practically every other oppressive government in the world fails to realize is that when you put pressure on men, they don't die, they grow. That one year sentence changed Mr. Patrice Lumumba's life forever. It's almost like he suddenly became a man on a mission and nothing could stop him. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. After his release from prison in 1958, Mr. Patrice Lumumba, along with other Congolese leaders, launched the Congolese National Movement, the first nationwide Congolese political party. And later that year, in the month of December, he attended the first All-African People's Conference in Accra, Ghana, where he met nationalists from across the African continent. While there, he was made a member of the permanent organization which was set up by the conference. The leaders there were very impressed by Mr. Lumumba's vocabulary. They wondered how a young man such as he could possess such mastery of words and wisdom at such a young age. So immediately they were able to pick him out as somebody who is brilliant. But what they did not know is that a young Patrice used to write poems and essays for the Congolese journals. That is how he became so good with words and anywhere he spoke, the people just took a liking to the message that he was putting across. After Mr. Patrice's meeting with the African nationalists, he became very inspired by Pan-African goals and sought to bring those very goals to Congo through nationalism. As nationalism began to grow popular in Congo, the Belgian government announced plans to initiate independence 
for the Congo. Now how exactly did they plan to do this? They intended to hold a general election in 1959 December. But the nationalists who were with uh, Patrice Lumumba, they saw this as a ploy by the Belgian government to install puppets to the very helm of power in this new country called Congo. So naturally they just boycotted the election and the entire nation followed suit. The Belgian authorities were enraged by this move by Patrice and his friends and they responded in devastating fashion. On October 30th, there was a clash in Stanleyville that resulted in 30 deaths. After that, who did they arrest? The man who they considered to be the ringleader, Mr. Patrice Lumumba. For a second time in his life, Mr. Patrice found himself behind bars. He was imprisoned on the charge of inciting others to riot. But that will not be the last time that they heard from Mr. Patrice Lumumba the phenomenon. In January 1960, the Belgian government convened a roundtable conference in Brussels, which brought together all Congolese parties to discuss political change. But the Congolese national movement refused to participate in the discussions without Lumumba involved. As such, Mr. Lumumba was released from prison and flown to Brussels. With his arrival, the meeting could proceed. The conference agreed on a date for independence, which was to be June the 30th, with the national elections in May. As expected, the Congolese national movement did exceedingly well in the elections, and Mr. Lumumba became the lead nationalist politician of the Congo, and was asked to form the first government, which he did on June the 24th, 1960. This cemented his status as the founding father of the Republic of Congo. Sadly for Mr. Lumumba, as is usually the case with positions of power, problems immediately began to spring up the very moment that he assumed office. This caused Belgium to send in troops to protect Belgian nationals from the ensuing chaos. But they were there for more than just that. The Belgian troops landed in Katanga, where they worked hand in hand with Chombe's illegal government. By this time, Patrice had seen enough and he had had enough. He had already been in prison twice, he had already been accused falsely twice. The man was tired and he decided to take drastic measures that would then go on to put the Belgian government and the Western powers into very serious panic. His first approach was diplomatic. He appealed to the United Nations to remove the Belgians from their land. The Belgian troops were aware of the request Mr. Patrice had made, but they did not leave. On the other side, the United Nations forces refused to suppress the Katanga revolt. And this is when Mr. Patrice showed his bravado and let the Belgians know that they were dealing with a man and a half. The first thing Mr. Patrice did was appeal to the Soviets to provide planes which would airlift his men to Katanga. He was ready to take the fight to their doorstep. And the Katangans and the Belgians knew very well that if the Soviets provided those planes, then they would also provide the munition. And if that was the case, then they would be crushed in the field of battle. And if that wasn't enough, Mr. Patrice asked all the independent African states to meet him at Leopold and to rally behind him. This moves alarmed many, including President Kasavubu. Just to catch you up to speed, at the time, Congo had two leaders, a president and a prime minister. Patrice was the prime minister and Kasavubu was the president. Power was split in between the two men and in politics, that can create serious problems as it evidently did. On September 5, President Kasavubu dismissed Lumumba and that was the genesis of two groups emerging, each staking a claim to be the de facto central government. While they bickered, on September 14, a strongman called Mobutu Seseseko seized power using the Congolese army. Mobutu Seseseko was like a shark in the water. He could smell blood from a mile away and he was very good at picking out opportunities to feed. He took the two men by surprise and they didn't know what hit them. Despite seizing power, Mobutu Seseseko reached a working agreement with Kasavubu. In November, the United Nations General Assembly officially recognized the credentials of Kasavubu's government simply because the Belgians had a preference to it and also because it wasn't allied to the Soviets like Mr. Patrice's regime. While all this was happening, Mr. Lumumba had been placed under house arrest in Leopold, guarded by strongman Mobutu's forces 
and also by the United Nations as well. But as soon as the United Nations General Assembly decided to recognize Kasavubu's government, Lumumba escaped from home confinement and tried to make it to Stanleyville, where his supporters had control. Sadly, he was caught by Mobutu Seseko's forces and arrested on December the 2nd. What Mr. Patrice Lumumba did not know is that he was fast approaching his death and he was actually living out his final moments. Lumumba was initially held at a military camp in Thaisville, now known as Mbanza Ngungu. But there was fear that the soldiers there were sympathetic to him, and so the Belgian and the Congolese and the Kantagan forces arranged to transfer him to a different location that they deemed to be more secure. This is where Mr. Patrice Lumumba would ultimately die. On January 17, 1961, Lumumba alongside two other companions, Joseph Okito and Maurice Mpolo, were flown to Lubumashi, where they were delivered to the secessionist regime in Katanga and its Belgian advisors. This was the first time that Mr. Patrice Lumumba would come face to face with those who sought to overthrow him and those that he himself sought to overthrow. And it's sad that he met them when he was at his weakest. He had no army, no weapons, nothing. It was just him, his god, and his two companions. Later that day, Mr. Lumumba Mr. Okito and Mr. Mpolo were executed by a firing squad under Belgian command. Their bodies were buried in shallow graves but later on they dug them up under the direction of Belgian officers and they were hacked to pieces. The Belgians knew that if the public were to see the bodies, it would cause public outrage across the entire Congo. It's the same way that after they killed Jesus, they made sure to hide his body. Because even his body being out there could cause the government problems. And it's the same thing for Patrice Lumumba. They didn't want his body to be found because some people would be very angry and he would become a martyr and they didn't want that. So the Kantagan government withheld the information that Mr. Patrice had been murdered and they sat on it intentionally up until February the 13th and they told the general public that he had escaped and he was caught by villagers who went on to kill him. Despite those petty lies, the rumors of the murder of Patrice Lumumba had already begun circulating from the moment that he was murdered. Although the full details surrounding his murder would only be discovered decades later, it was a well-guarded and a well-hidden state secret. And it's no wonder because Kasavubu was involved, the president at the time, and then Mobutu Seseko, who usurped power out of nowhere, he actually succeeded him to become the second president of the republic. So for as long as those people were in power, that cut was not going to be let out of the bag. Nonetheless, the death of Mr. Patrice Lumumba made everyone in the Congo and across the world love him. In fact, even his own enemies, some of them who even conspired to kill him, declared him a national hero. And that is what he is up until this day. Now in memory of Mr. Patrice Lumumba, allow me to read for you a very small snippet of a speech that he gave just six months before he went on to be murdered. And I quote, We are going to show the world what the black man and woman can do when he works in freedom. And we are going to make Congo the center of the sun's radiance for all of Africa. We are going to keep watch over the lands of our country so that they truly profit her children. If you enjoyed the video, kindly consider hitting the subscribe button and the like button. And also, if you'd like to support the channel, click the join button at the bottom. You'll be able to join our various membership packages. I will also pin a link to the comment section that can get you to that very same landing page. Well, that's it from me for now. We'll be posting more documentaries. And actually, do let me know in the comment section below what other documentary would you like us to cover. All right, guys. Adios. Thank you for choosing David Wafula as your primary news platform. We put countless hours in research, recording, and editing. By showing up each and every day to watch our videos, you encourage us to generate more videos for the viewers. We are on a mission to inform, educate, and build a better tomorrow. To our thousands of followers in a world full of presidents, kings, and queens, you are the real gem. Adios.